morning, friends. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This morning we will celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration, which was two days ago on Friday, but we move it to today. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, number 173, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Transfiguration this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. God spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud, and they kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. Uh, well, welcome. We, we are um, five of us here this morning, so uh, let us turn and wave at one another. Say good morning and uh, welcome to church. Uh, thank you for the warm water. That's just what I need. I've had. Um, some bronchitis the last couple of weeks, and so I had to take a steroid puffer, and so my vocal cords are not very strong today. So I apologize for that. Um, fortunately, my test was negative, so we're all negative here today. Uh, so welcome if you're co uh, coming in from around the world. We're so glad that you can worship with us here this morning as we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration. And a special thanks to our organist, Natalie, for coming in to join us this morning. Let us greet one another. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be his kingdom, kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray the colic for purity as we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. 
we declare together the Gloria as we say, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. I'd like to thank uh, Crystal as she is sharing the uh, collects and prayers and responses and hymns uh, on the Facebook Live. Please follow along with us as we join in the collect or theme prayer for the Transfiguration Sunday. We pray together, O God, who on the Holy Mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the Old Testament reading, which is read to us this morning by Marlene Bayant. Thank you, Marlene. The Old Testament from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand. Moses did not know that the skin of the, his face was shown because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses sp spoke with them afterward, all the Israelites came near <clears throat> and he gave them in commandments and all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites, what he had been commanded. The Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Let us join together in Psalm 99, and we'll say it uh, from me to thee by half verses. So I say the first half, and then you all respond with the second half. The Lord is King, let the people tremble. He is enthroned at Mount Jerusalem, in the fear of shame. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. Almighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. He called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As he was in the beginning, now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is read to us by Miss Donna. Good 
The epistle reading is taken from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myth when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father. When that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. We will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Let us turn and sing number 79, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Let us sing up a la Baldi. <laughs> According to St. Luke, chapter 9, beginning at verse 28. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they stood two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. 
Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days, and told no one any of the things that they had seen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Uh, may we pray. Lord, we ask that this morning that uh, in the week ahead that you would give us a fresh vision of Jesus, that we may see him ascended and glorified, that we may understand the wonder that God has come to dwell with, uh, with us uh, on earth and has come to be our Saviour and our friend. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, uh, dear friends. <laughs> Those of you who are here this morning may also like to use your phones to follow along um, because Crystal will be posting some outline points. Or you can just listen to me uh, if you prefer, that's fine. And, um, and hear the message that way. Now, um, I want to ask you to think back uh, whether you've ever had a mountaintop experience. We have the phrase in English, a mountaintop experience, to describe some incredible high point uh, in our life, which perhaps was a watershed or a turning point. Mountaintops are watersheds. They're the point at which the water flows one way or the other. And when we reach a mountaintop experience, it's often a watershed in our life. Recently, we know Lani has shared her testimony of having a mountaintop experience on our prayer retreat last October, where up until the moment when she encountered the presence of God in her prayer time, the water had been flowing one way, flowing in, in a direction of, of grief and uh, depression, discouragement, and turning away from serving the Lord. And then in that moment of encountering the presence of Christ, the water began to flow the other way, she reached the mountaintop, as it were, with Christ, and the water began to flow in the direction of encouragement and joy and prayer and power. Today's sermon will be uh, unusual for me. Often I preach topical sermons where I take a topic such as the Transfiguration and talk about it. But today I want to do something I don't often do. I want to use a sermon model which is called an expository sermon. The expository sermon is where you go through the passage verse by verse and phrase by phrase to see what you can learn and draw out. So it's not a sermon with three points. It might be a sermon with two points or 20 points, depending on how many points you find in the passage that you're looking at. So we're going to have an expository sermon, but I'm going to do it with a twist. Today, uh, as we go through, we're going to look at the three accounts um, it's not only that we find the account of the transfiguration in Luke, it's also in Matthew and in Mark. Now you may know that the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are called by scholars the synoptic Gospels, from the word synopsis or synthesis. And this is because the three Gospels focus on the deeds and the acts uh, in the life of Jesus, and they share common material. They have common accounts with some minor differences. For example, this story of the transfiguration occurs in Matthew, Mark and Luke. But in two of the Gospels, it says that it takes place six days after he was in Caesarea Philippi. And in the third Gospel, it says eight days. So there's a slight difference. One of the Gospel writers adds two days on for travelling time, you could say. It means about a week. So there are very slight differences. But we're going to look at the three passages together, and Crystal will be posting them online uh, as we go. Before we get to the expository sermon, though, I want to ask the question, why are we studying or reading about or celebrating the Feast of the Transfiguration today, in the middle of August, in the middle of the ordinary Sundays of the year? And why is it important? So first of all, the, the first question, why do we celebrate it today? In fact, we read the account of the Transfiguration more than any other event in the life of Jesus in our church lectionary, in our cycle uh, throughout the year as we're reading, because we read about it in Epiphany. In fact, it's the last reading in Epiphany before we begin Lent. 
Epiphany means the revealing of Christ to the world. So in Epiphany, we focus on those stories or events which reveal that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is God made man. So, for example, we begin Epiphany with the baptism of Jesus, where we see the spirit descending bodily on Christ. And we hear the voice of God, the father from heaven. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. We finish Epiphany with the readings of the Transfiguration, where once again, in the middle of Jesus' ministry, the voice from heaven is heard, this is my beloved son, listen to him, or this is my chosen son, listen to him. And once again, we see the glory of Jesus uh, shining, the glory of God shining through Jesus. So he is revealed to be God incarnate with us. So we read these readings way back in Epiphany, before Lent, before Easter. But why do we read them in August, for goodness sake? Well, it's because of an interesting accident of history. Now, the Eastern Orthodox, I have to say, are very enamored with this story. And we in the Western Christian Church should be more enamored with it. It's a very important story in the life and ministry of Jesus, as you will see today. Um, some non-Eastern churches, the Anglican and the Catholic, as well as the Eastern Orthodox, celebrate it on August the 6th, last Friday. Well, the reason we do it at this time of year is that 500 years ago, roughly in 1456, the Pope at the time, Pope Calixtus III, ordered the celebration of the Transfiguration on the 6th of August. Up until that time, there hadn't been a fixed date for it. And he did so to celebrate Thanksgiving for the victory over the Muslim Turkish invaders of Mehmet the Conqueror or Mehmet the Second. Fresh from the, from the conquest of Constantinople, they were marauding across Europe, slaughtering all that they encountered and taking pr prisoners. People were terrified. A very relatively small force of Hungarians and others at the city of Belgrade, led by a man called John Hunyadi and the Hungarian forces, defeated a vastly superior uh, invasion, jihad invasion force at the siege of Belgrade. Before the siege, the Pope had sent messages throughout the Christian world, calling on churches to ring the noonday bell to ask people to prayer for deliverance from the jihadi conquerors. But the news of the victory was so amazing and shocking that it traveled faster than the messages carrying the prayer request. So the news of the victory arrived in England before the request to ring the noonday bell and call people to prayer for deliverance. So when the messengers arrived to ask the English church to pray for deliverance, they had already heard of the victory. Their prayers had been answered before they prayed them. So they developed a mythology in the European church that the noonday bell was rung to celebrate the victory. In fact, it was rung to pray for the victory. But after the victory, churches to this day continue to ring the noonday bell and to pray in the Catholic Church. They pray the Angelus, uh, Hail Mary and so forth. Uh, but the noonday bell continues to call people to prayer. Originally, it was a call to prayer for deliverance from jihad. So it's a very interesting little bit of history that Pope Calixtus uh, called on the church to celebrate the feast of the transfiguration, to give thanks for the deliverance of the Christian world from a vastly superior jihad army that was invading them. However, the commemoration of this transfiguration goes back much earlier, 250 years before um, John Hunyari defended Belgrade, St. Francis visited the Holy Land and he observed, ironically, the Muslim call to prayer. He came back to the Western Church and he introduced, it said, the prayer bell at noon um, in, in a, a way of, of following or learning from the Islamic world. So there's a sort of irony there. But the commemoration of the Transfiguration, that was about in 1200, the 1200s, 
But the commemoration of the Transfiguration goes back much further to the first millennium. And throughout the Christian world, people would celebrate the Transfiguration, but at different times. So that's why we do it today. We also do it, of course, as I said, in Epiphany. That's just a little bit of interesting history, I think. Now, why, uh, why, do we, why do we celebrate it at all? Well, it's a very important story. One reason we know that it's important is that it's central. It's physically in the center of Matthew and Mark, and it's theologically in the center of Luke's gospel. It finds itself in actually the physical watershed of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. So it's physically central. At the halfway junction in Matthew and Mark, we come to Peter's confession of Christ. You are the Christ, Peter said. This took place in the north of Israel at Caesarea Philippi, just uh, near Mount Hermon, way up in the cold north. And from this point, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must turn to Jerusalem to suffer and die. So after his confession, Peter's confession, you are the Christ, Jesus turns his focus from the ministry and the villages to turn his face to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. And from there, the story moves to its climax with the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. But as the narrative resumes its course, after the teaching which follows the prediction of the Passion, we have the story of the transfiguration. In Luke's gospel, you find the same pattern as Matthew and Mark. There is Peter's confession, the prediction by Jesus of his death and resurrection, some teaching, and then the transfiguration in Luke 9. Shortly after the transfiguration, we read that the time approaches for Jesus to be taken up into heaven. And so he resolutely sets out for Jerusalem. The end is in sight. Now there is one other indication why the transfiguration is so important. It is connected to the baptism of Jesus. Only twice in the Synoptic Gospels do we hear a voice from heaven. The first time is at the baptism and the second time is at the transfiguration. God speaks audibly. This is my son, the chosen, the beloved. Listen to him. Pay attention. Wake up, people. If the baptism signifies the beginning phase of Jesus' public ministry, the transfiguration signifies the beginning of the end, the beginning of the closing phase. So that's the second reason why it's important. It's physically central. It's connected to the baptism. And thirdly, it's very dramatic. It's arguably the most dramatic thing that takes place in the story other than the ascension of Jesus. It's arguably even more dramatic than the, than the resurrection, although that could be debated. We have only to think of the content of the Transfiguration account to have our sense of the importance of the gospel message reinforced. Its visually dramatic features exceed those of other parts of the gospel. None seem as visibly spectacular except perhaps the ascension. Not even the miracles performed by Jesus. So one question that arises is, are there other references to the transfiguration other than in the three Gospels? And the answer is there's a few. We read this morning, or Donna read this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, where Peter says, we apostles are not following cleverly invented stories. He says, we're not telling you mythology when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. He says we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This is important. Eyewitness is the primary source of evidence in courts and has been for thousands and thousands of years. The primary way, whether we know something is true or not, is from eyewitnesses. Our parents are witnesses to us of many things. Our school teachers are eyewitnesses who we trust. And the gospel writers say, we are eyewitnesses. We're not telling you made up stories. We saw his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him 
from the majestic glory, that's God in heaven, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. This testimony puts this story firmly in the middle of history. This is not someone telling us a mythology or a fairy story. These are eyewitnesses telling us we saw this. So it needs to be judged as to its historical value. But there are also a few other echoes of the transfiguration in the New Testament. For example, the story of Paul's conversion has similar elements. We have Jesus appearing in a vision. We have a bright light from heaven and a voice from heaven. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, says Paul. Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. We also have in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, a very rare word, the word to transfigure or transform. It only occurs in the transfiguration and in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul uses it to describe the Christian life. Like Christ, we are being transformed or literally transfigured. The glory of God is shining through us to transfigure us Into his likeness, says Paul, with ever increasing glory. Have you ever thought about that? That God is transfiguring you with his light shining through you to others. And again, in the first chapter of Revelation, with its dramatic portrayal of Jesus, it resonates with the flavor of the transfiguration story. Now, John's gospel is intriguing because it contains no reference to the transfiguration. But it is a gospel which is full of the glory of Jesus. And a voice from heaven thunders that God has glorified his name and will glorify it again in John 12, 28. In John chapter 1, we read at the birth of Jesus, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. John has no need of the transfiguration. He is not telling an event by event Um, historical account. Rather, John is telling a theological and philosophical account of the teaching and the life of Christ. The great I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. John is concerned with messianic meaning more than messianic events. He is writing about meaning for a Greek audience rather than messianic events for a Jewish audience. So John leaves out the transfiguration. I guess he felt the other three chaps had done a good enough job. Now, at this point, Crystal is going to post all three of the accounts from Matthew 17, 1 to 9, Mark 9, 2 to 10, and Luke 9, 28 to 36. You can refer to them uh, as we go through, but I will also uh, explain where we're up to. So we're now going to go through Uh, in parallel and look verse by verse and phrase by phrase at the story and see what we can learn from it. I hope you're coping with my voice today. Let's compare verse by verse. So we begin uh, this morning um, with the phrase after six days or after eight days. Remember that in an expository sermon the point is not to come up with three main points. The point is just to see what the scripture says. Uh, Marlene, can I ask you to close that door for me because the light is a bit bright. Just put the brick there to keep it closed. Thank you, dear. So after six days, Matthew and Mark are harmonious here with their specific details and their general storyline. Luke seems to have an earlier source. He seems to have another source that Matthew and Mark uh, don't have. (coughs) Consequently, Mark and Matthew offer details that agree with each other. They both say it was six days after Peter's profession, you are the Christ at Caesarea Philippi. Luke says it was eight days. Whether it was six or eight, it's about a week later. The transfiguration occurs a week after Peter's famous confession at Caesarea Philippi. Maybe Luke was allowing for travelling time. The next phrase, it says Peter... And James 
and John, his brother. So uh, we have here the, the three main BFFs, the best friends of Jesus, Peter and James and John, his brother. James and John were brothers. They were called the sons of thunder. You notice the preeminence of Peter. Again and again, Peter is mentioned, even when the other two are not. We see that Peter is a leader. Uh, we remember that James and John were hot-tempered. The brothers that used to fight together. Fishermen all from the Sea of Galilee. The sons of Zebedee and Salome. We remember that traditionally James is thought to have become the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. During Jesus' life and ministry, James was not a believer. But after the resurrection, he became a believer. John, his brother, is known as the beloved disciple that very, very clever author of the Gospel of John. The next phrase we read, Jesus leads them to a high mountain apart. But which mountain was the mountain of the transfiguration? Most scholars give two possibilities, Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. In our Gospel reading today in Luke, it says they went up to the mountain to pray. The other Gospels tell us it was a high mountain. It seems to me personally, scholars debate this because Mount Hermon is right next to Caesarea Philippi. So it would have been logical to go up Mount Hermon. But Mount Hermon is much higher and it slopes up gradually. It doesn't really stand out in the, in the surrounding area except when the snow is on the top. But Mount Tabor is about a week's journey away. So that would account for the week in between. And it stands out in the plain of Galilee like a volcanic plug sticking up in the middle of the earth. It seems to me that Mount Tabor is a better choice, perhaps because I've been up there, so I'm biased. Early church fathers such as Origen and Cyril of Jerusalem and St. Jerome spoke of a high mountain apart, which is what Mount Tabor is. It stands apart from its surroundings. After the event of the Transfiguration, we read in Mark 9.30 that Jesus goes on from there and passes through Galilee. He wouldn't have been able to do that if he was at Mount Hermon. But Galilee is all around Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is in Galilee, so the story flows naturally from this idea of a high mountain apart in Galilee. Already in apostolic times, the Mount of Transfiguration was known as the Holy Mount, we read that in 2 Peter 1.18. It seems to have been known by the faithful uh, of the country and by tradition as Mount Tabor with a TH. Origen in 2.31 said, Mount Tabor is the mountain of Galilee on which Christ was transfigured. So that's a very early memory, only 200 years after the event. St. Cyril of Jerusalem and St. Jerome likewise declare categorically that it was Mount Tabor. So the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, explicitly describe the time lapse of about a week uh, between the um, discourse in Caesarea and the Transfiguration. And as I said, this would explain the journey. All right, moving on, we come to the next phrase. Only, it's only found in Luke, though. It's not in Matthew or Mark. And the next phrase is, he went on the mountain to pray, as he was praying. And here we find the first lesson that I want to underline. Luke does not say that Jesus led the three disciples up the high mountain, but to the mountain, the mountain to pray. Mark and Matthew are clearer that this is a high mountain, apart from everything surrounding. It implies a deserted loneliness, which is descriptive of Mount Tabor. Not too many people are hurrying up there. It's very steep. Luke twice emphasizes that he went up to pray and that there is prayer taking place. Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. And as he is praying, his appearance is changed. It's in prayer that he is transfigured. We have seen Luke repeatedly emphasize Jesus is a man of prayer and we are called to be people of prayer. So if you're making notes at home, you can make this the first learning point or the first lesson that I want to draw out. Jesus is a person of prayer. He is often found praying alone. And we know there is blessing and power in prayer, alone in the presence of God. 
In the next story about the healing of the demoniac boy, we hear that the disciples lacked faith and the power of prayer. The next phrase is, he was then, as he was praying, transfigured before them. As I've mentioned, the word transfigured is metamorphosis in English. It means a complete change or transformation, such as happens to a, uh, what do you call it, caterpillar, transforming into a butterfly, or a, a bulb, which transforms into a tulip flower. Jesus' body is transformed from an earthly body into his heavenly body, from a human body into a resurrected body. It is the teaching of the Bible that our bodies, too, will be transformed in heaven. And that our, our heavenly bodies will be glorious. This is the second lesson. As the creed says, we will be raised bodily and we will be transformed. This is the second lesson for us. We have the hope of the resurrection and we have the hope of a heavenly body to come. The next phrase is, Matthew says his face shone like the sun. We find the same words in Revelation, that Jesus shone like the brightness of the sun. He had this shining, which is synonymous with the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. The Shekinah, the shining, the glory of God. The next phrase is, his garments became white as light, glistening and intensely white or dazzling white. It's as if Jesus' appearance radiates an eternal light, such as will happen to people when we have been transformed and appear before God. It's like the face of Moses that shone with the glory of God after he had been in the presence of God. This shining represents the glory of the presence of God. Jesus is revealing what we will look like in the grand and glorious future. The old Negro spirituals will sing about, I'm going to glory, glory land. That grand and glorious future where we will continue with our identity. We will be ourselves but we will be shining and transformed and transfigured, shining with the light of the glory of God. Luke uses the phrase dazzling white to describe the two men in the resurrection tomb in Luke 24 verse 4. The two angels were in dazzling white. And we also hear anecdotal stories of people who have near-death experiences and report seeing bright, radiant figures that come to meet them. This happened to my best friend in high school's father who had a near-death experience and went through the dark tunnel and saw the bright figures of friends and relatives coming to meet him before he returned to life. The next phrase is, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah. This story is packed with meaning and with, it, with drama and significance. Imagine this, Moses and Elijah, Moses representing the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Moses, the, the greatest lawgiver, and Elijah, the first and greatest of the prophets, who represents the second portion of the Old Testament. Jesus called the Old Testament the law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah personify the word of God, the story of salvation, the two greatest, most powerful figures in Judeo-Christian ancient history. And here is our fourth lesson. The law is acknowledged but fulfilled in the transfiguration of Jesus. Moses and Elijah fade into insignificance in comparison with the revelation of the Messiah, the transfigured incarnate Son of God. They are made obsolete, the letter to the Romans tells us. They are abolished, passed over and fulfilled when the living word has come. We go on with our phrases and Luke says, they appeared in glorious splendor. This is a small insertion by Luke and it's a juicy tidbit. You see the word glory or glorious splendor. This is the word doxa and it occurs again a few sentences later. The glory of God from which we get our word doxology. The word implies a shining, radiant, illuminating presence. Next, we come to our fifth point of learning from this passage. The theme of glory reminds us that we too will live in glory. This is actually the same as the third point. It's a bit superfluous. But the glory of Moses and Elijah 
reminds us that we will share in the glory of the Messiah. So moving along, Luke says, they spoke of Jesus' departure. The word is literally exodus, his exodus. He's going to leave, he's going to die. He's going to exit the stage and it will be accomplished in Jerusalem. Just as the Jews in the Old Testament exited, they had their exodus or departure to the promised land. So Jesus will have his exodus to the promised land in glory in heaven. This departure will take place in Jerusalem, the place of his death and resurrection. It was as if Moses and Elijah see the future and they are there to comfort and strengthen Jesus for the road that lies ahead. So Luke goes on. Now Peter and those who were with Jesus were heavy with sleep and when they were awakened, they saw his glory. How like Peter. Dear Peter, we can identify with the humanity and the patheticness of Peter. Peter is singled out. James and John don't get mentioned. Peter is the number one sleeper. When Jesus needs him most to be awake, he's asleep. God bless him. Once again, asleep at the wheel. Peter's name and role are highlighted in the story. He is to be the rock on which the church is to be built. This sleepy, dopey, feisty man with foot in mouth disease. It says, it goes on, and Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Peter is clearly the leader. He takes the initiative to be spokesman and to speak for the disciples. We are reminded that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. There could be hardly a less worthy candidate to be the leader of the early church. But God calls us in our brokenness, even when we're asleep at the wheel, to be his servants. So the story goes on. Peter says, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths or tents or tabernacles. This is in all three Gospels. He says one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. The word booths here is a Greek word skene, which means tabernacles or tents. We ask a question. Why would Peter suggest putting up three humpies, three little tents in the wilderness? Well, traditionally, one of the great Jewish festivals is the Feast of Tabernacles in which the Jews remember they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years living in tents and booths and humpies. So here Peter is reminded of the wilderness. They're up in the mountain in the wilderness having hiked up um, far up and Peter is reminded of this story where they built tabernacles in the wilderness and so it's the first thing that comes. He's obviously been to Sunday school and he says let's build three shelters here. It also means he wants to linger. He wants to stay in the presence of the transfigured Messiah and Moses and Elijah. He wants to remember the miraculous presence with him. This may have been Peter's logic. It goes on. He said this because he did not know what to say. He had foot in mouth disease. He was stumbling. He didn't know. He was confused. What do you say? What do you say when you see a transfiguration? One of the reasons I think the story is historical is because of the pathetic humanity and bumbling character in which the disciples are portrayed. If you were making up a story of a transfiguration, you wouldn't put in these idiotic comments by Peter being asleep and then bumbling along and saying silly things. It gives the truth, it gives a ring of truth to the story. Mark and Luke tell us that they spoke this way, Peter spoke this way, not only because they were confused, but because they were exceedingly afraid or terrified. They were in shock. And who wouldn't be? We have previously witnessed the fear of the disciples. And once again, they are afraid in the situation. Why are they afraid? Well, they've seen the bright and shining presence of God. It's a terrifying thing. And in a moment, the Gospel of Luke will say, they were afraid as they entered the cloud. They were afraid of this cloud, perhaps coming in rapidly and forming a whiteout all around them. Now, Crystal and I, as I've told you, had this experience. When we went up Mount Tabor, we were on the top of the mountain. It was a bright and shining blue sky day. And in the space of literally 10 seconds, clouds rolled over, shoom, 
And we went from bright sun and blue sky to absolute dense fog. And we were like, where are you? You know, you could see three feet in front of you. It was a, a scary, in a way, experience. It must have been even more scary after they had seen the bright and shining light transfiguring Christ. So the story goes on and says a cloud came and overshadowed them. The cloud symbolizes, of course, the presence of God. This is po learning point number seven. The Jews remembered that God had come to them in the cloud in the wilderness and the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. The cloud symbolizing the presence of Almighty God coming upon Israel in the wilderness. So here the disciples in the wilderness have the presence of Almighty God coming upon them. So the seventh learning point is that in the wilderness, when we are afraid, God's presence surrounds us. If you are in the wilderness and afraid, I want you to know that God's presence is surrounding you now. To be with Moses, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, Peter, James and John in a special way out on the shoulders of Mount Hermon. The cloud symbolizes the presence of God. And then the story with its drama is not done yet. We have the transfiguration. We have Moses and Elijah. We have the cloud rolling in. And now we have the voice of God from heaven. God's voice from heaven above. As it had spoken during the baptism of Jesus thunders again and the voice says this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased or my chosen one you can see this in all three parallels slightly different words but the same intent the father affirms the identity the son is the messiah Emmanuel God with us in Matthew the words are identical in both the baptism and the transfiguration Matthew 3 17 this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God the Father expresses the true identity of Jesus. It is God the Father who puts the chop, the seal, the imprimatur on the identity of who Jesus is. The question is settled once and for all in the presence of eyewitnesses, even as one would sign and chop a marriage certificate. When God the Father speaks, everyone is to pay attention. And listen, this is the eighth learning point. When God speaks, people pay attention. God gives the scoop. Jesus is my beloved son. Listen to him. There is no question here of some new age ascended master, some great moral teacher. All such humbug evaporates in the presence of the light and the glory and the voice of the divine one. This is my beloved son. Pay attention. Listen to him. And that is indeed the next phrase. All three gospels have the phrase. Listen to him. This phrase is in the Greek. In the present imperative tense. An imperative means a command. It means listen now. Pay it. When you're talking to your children. Use the present imperative. Pay attention now. Jesus, God the Father, is saying, listen up, people. As we know from John's Gospel, chapter 6, 68, he is the one with the words of eternal life. So God the Father is saying, listen up, pay attention. He is the words of life and the bread of life. We are to eat his words and to consume his presence. As, a, as an aside, as we reflect on listening to him, he came to heal the deaf, that they could hear him literally. But he also hears us in our spiritual deafness when we are asleep. He can open our ears to hear the truth. Just as we listen to a doctor attentively when we are receiving the news of a cancer or some other terrible disease, so we should listen with full attention. As Jesus tells us of our need of salvation, of our sin sickness, and our need of healing and deliverance for our soul. That's number eight. Pay attention. Point number nine, learning point number nine. The voice from heaven declares him to be none other than the Son of God. We are to listen carefully to the words of Jesus. Matthew adds, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their face 
and were filled uh, with awe. So point number eight was that this is no ordinary ascended master or moral teacher. This is God. Point number nine was pay attention, listen up. Point number ten is how do we respond? When you encounter the living God, what you do is you get on your face, you get on your knees and you worship him. And that's why we come to church on Sunday, to get on our knees, to get on our face, as it were, metaphorically, if not literally, to bow down, to reverence him, to worship him. He is the almighty one. He alone is worthy of our praise. God wants our heart to be moved with awe when we comprehend the true identity of this Jesus, this transfigured one. And then going on, we read, Jesus came and touched them and said, rise and have no fear. This is point number 11. No fear. How gracious Jesus is. How gracious. In the midst of their terror and their confusion, he touches them and says, rise, fear not. And in the next phrase, they lifted up their eyes and saw no one. And Luke's gospel says, when the voice had spoken, they lifted up their eyes and they didn't see Moses and Elijah. And here comes point number 12. When we see Jesus, it's only Jesus, sola Jesus. No need for Moses, no need for Elijah, no need for the law and the prophets, no need even for the commandments. We have the living word and the two great commandments and the great commission. We are the people of the new covenant, not only of the old covenant. We see Jesus and we need see nothing else. That's point number 12. Luke goes on. We're nearly done. He adds, they kept silent and they told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Isn't that so different to us? The first thing we want to do is blah, 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 blah. The Orthodox say the only appropriate response to a vision and understanding of God is silence. Because how can you put into words the things you've seen? Of course, eventually we have to open our mouth. Otherwise, how can others know and believe? But they kept silence. They were dumbstruck with awe. And you know what? Sometimes we Christians need to be dumbstruck a bit more than we are. Sometimes we're too quick to speak. We should first of all be dumbstruck with awe before we open our mouth and say something. The story goes on. Mark and Matthew reveal, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged and commanded them to tell no one. This is what is called the messianic secret. And we read the vision, what they had seen. The word vision is highlighted in Matthew unusually. It's usually Luke who's keen on visions. Luke tells us about many visions. For Luke, vision is a positive word. But here we have the Gospel of Matthew using the word vision. And here comes point number 13. We need a fresh vision of Jesus. Pray for a fresh vision. Some of us, our vision of Jesus has become jaded and weary. And it, it is competed out by all sorts of entertainments. And we no longer come on Sunday to fall on our face in awe before the transfigured one. Because we are too busy with a thousand trivialities. But we are called to have a fresh vision of the transfigured one. To fall Sunday by Sunday on our face before him. And to worship him with God's people. The story goes on. Until the Son of Man is raised from the dead, say Matthew and Mark. Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. He uses the messianic title. We are to worship him and to get a new vision of him until the Son of Man is raised from the dead and returns in glory. The resurrection is coming. That's point number 14. Our, at this time, it's our resurrection. Our resurrection is coming. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what was this resurrection? They didn't understand yet. There was no precedent for talking about resurrections, contrary to what social media says. First century religion had no knowledge of God's dying and rising again. That is a historical interp interpolation. They had no knowledge of the idea of death and resurrection for the Messiah. They hadn't understood uh, the Isaiah 53, the Psalm 22, and that the suffering servant must die and rise again. These closest three disciples didn't comprehend the impending resurrection. 
Do we comprehend our impending resurrection? We are so concerned about dying. We have taken our eyes off the prize. The prize is not the end. It's not finishing the race. It's not the death that we all face, but the resurrection that lies beyond. Jesus tells us that his closest disciples were asking, what does this rising from the dead mean? It means that you have a hope of eternity. It means we will be with him in glory land. And as we close today, we close with Peter's great words in 2 Peter 1, 16 to 19, which Donna read to us. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Peter says, we heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. We have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp. I'm still reading Peter. You will do well to listen to this as to pay attention to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. The morning star is Jesus. It's a metaphor of the Messiah. It's an Old Testament metaphor. He is the morning star that rises in our hearts. So as we conclude today, I'm going to run through those 14 or 15 learning points. Actually, point three and point five were the same. Number one, this power in prayer. Number two, we need to be transformed on earth for we will be transfigured in heaven. Number three, we will shine with the glory of God. Number four, the law and the prophets have been fulfilled and made obsolete. Number five, see number three, we will shine with the glory, even as Jesus did, as Moses and Elijah did. Number six, Peter is the leader, but he is asleep at the wheel. God qualifies the call. He doesn't call the qualified. Number seven, in his wilderness confusion and fear, God's presence falls and enfolds them. Number eight, God says, this is my beloved son. This is no good moral teacher. This is no new age master nonsense. This is God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. Number nine, listen now. Listen up before it's too late. Number 10, our reaction to the revelation is to worship him. Get on your knees, fall on your face, kneel at home with your family and pray and worship him. Number 11, there is no fear in Jesus. His love drives out all fear. He says, fear not. Number 12, after this experience, they only saw Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And they were awestruck and silent at first. Then they went on and told the story. Number 13, pray for a fresh vision of Jesus that brings us to our knees. Number 14, the resurrection is coming. His has come and yours is coming. Number, look forward to it. Number 15, pay attention. Pay attention, says Peter in his epistle. This is not mythology. This is history. Pay attention until the morning star rises in your heart and you too will be transfigured. Peter says this is true. You can trust it. Amen. Well, you got a bit more than you bargained for this morning, but I figure you can always put me on pause. Not the poor folks who are here this morning, but the folks at home, you can always pause and go and have a cup of coffee. Let us turn to the creed, which for our friends here is found on page four. And we will stand and affirm our faith here in Morrison Chapel in the words of the Nicene Creed. As we declare together, we believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. Please be seated at, or kneel as you prefer as we pray for the world and John will come and lead us in our intercessions this morning. Uh, this morning I'll use form 3 which is on page 31. <clears throat> Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church and that we all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your, that your name may be glorified by all people. people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, they that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrament. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let's take a moment to pray for our own needs and the needs of others. <coughs> And to you we give the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbour as we pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be. We may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sin through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another. The peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, friends. 
Let us sing our offertory hymn, number 679. There's a light upon the mountain, 679. It is right and a good and joyful thing 
always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, who right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and the archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God, 
Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I should mention at this point that although 700,000 people got negative tests, um, however, the doctors don't know at what point the nucleic acid test will reveal the infection. So they don't know how long after you're infected before you show infection. So there is still a risk that it's in the community and um, they will be retesting, I'm sure. So in that spirit, I offer you communion and you can receive it in one kind, just the bread, or in two kinds as you prefer. Please be careful when you're dipping. Body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. Blood of Christ, keep you in eternal life. As in the body of Christ was broken for you. Not in the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. It's not in the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. I see the body of Christ was broken for you. Dear friends, let us turn to page 25. I'd like to thank um, all the friends who've joined us online today around the world and in Macau and Hong Kong. It's lovely to share fellowship with you here today. I hope that you feel edified and that you have been able to receive the presence of Christ uh, spiritually through this celebration of Thanksgiving this morning. Let us pray um, as we remember the words of God, listen to him. Let us pray as we say together, O oh, eternal God, heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you to those who helped with the service today, our online poster of prayers, our organist, our Christopher, and our uh, congregation, our videographer, Thank you, everybody. Let us sing our closing hymn this morning, uh, number 327, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Three, two, seven. <laughs>
Thank you, Natalie. Hallelujah. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, friends, in Facebook land. I'll let you turn that off. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. God bless everybody. Have a lovely Sunday. Thank you, John. Thank Amen. you, Marcy. Well, we have a whole team today. So.